Greetings, this is Top Hat and Buttered Popcorn. My name is John Savers, I'm your host, and today we'll take a look at a couple of films, beginning with Doubt. Uh, this is a film directed by John Patrick Shanley. Uh, it, he is also uh, the author of the a play uh, upon which it is based. Uh, therefore, uh, he adapted it for the film. Uh, it also uh, stars Meryl Streep as a sister Aloysius uh, Bovier. Yeah, we have Amy Adams as a uh, sister James. We have Philip Seymour Hoffman as a father Brendan Flynn. Uh, Viola uh, Davis uh, stars as Mrs. Miller and uh, Joseph Foster uh, stars as uh, her son, uh, Donald Miller. Cast of many. Um, this is a, a very unsatisfying film uh, in many ways um, because it is not one with resolution. Uh, whatever your opinion on this particular subject uh, is, I, it cannot be advanced or um, diminished much by this particular film. Uh, the value of the film uh, is uncertain. Uh, it is a, um, a, a film that um, has a currency now. Uh, it is a, um, a particularly contemporary type of uh, story to uh, consider. But as I said, there's not resolution. There's no answer. You can't be satisfied with uh, the deal. Uh, and everybody who has opinions is going to be pretty much uh, left with the same opinion. Therefore, I don't see that it advances people too much uh, one way or the other uh, in this uh, particular matter. Now, it might be considered roughly or generally speaking to be a um, conservative and disciplinarian nun uh, versus a progressive a priest with Elvis Presley in the background singing Suspicion. Um, this is a, um, a film which uh, tries to suggest, on the one hand, guilt, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the, um, the evil of warrantless uh, accusations of evidence this uh, accusations, uh, rumor-mongering, as it were, and so forth. Uh, to this end, uh, we do have the priest, who is the object of uh, suspicion, uh, at one point uh, giving a rather uh, vivid little sermon on the problems that are created by rumor-mongerers. Uh, on the other hand, we see also a series of circumstantial uh, uh, events, evidences, um, which uh, perhaps together warrant some uh, reason to be suspicious. Therefore, on the one hand, one can be sympathetic to this Hoffman character, a father, Flynn, and at the same time, <laughs> suspicious of him. So, you know, when it, when it gets to the end of the movie, uh, you're left with a kind of this uneasiness within yourself because on the one hand, uh, your progressive liberal aspect uh, um, wants to be against the, uh, the rumor mongering and all that, uh, no evidence and so forth. Uh, and the other hand, the um, the judgmental part, uh, maybe looking at this series of uh, little incidences and saying, hmm. So uh, this seems to be uh, the uh, role played by the Streep character, and she's quite good. And um, uh, she has an opportunity to um, have colloquies, uh, which are uh, rather uh, dynamic with Hoffman and also with Viola Davis. Uh, and uh, uh, 
those are the outstanding moments of this particular film. And the, uh, the um, primary reason, I would say, to, uh, to see it, uh, those uh, are salient uh, uh, interactions, brief as they are, and so forth, but uh, important. Uh, the film itself uh, has a milieu in a Roman Catholic school, um, which is an adjunct to a parish uh, church. Uh, and uh, it, um, uh, it appears to be um, uh, in the Brooklyn area of New York. And uh, we, we do get a little bit of period piece uh, of the ambience. Now, the period is uh, 1964. Uh, how do we know? Because the priest, Brendan uh, uh, Flynn, uh, in his initial sermon uh, before his parish, uh, reflects upon the period a year ago uh, when John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, and uh, he, he talks about how that brought us all together. Um, but um, uh, there is another problem which uh, does not uh, seem to bring people together, but uh, to uh, cause them to be isolated, and that is personal doubts. Um, and then he goes forth to make the point that uh, we all are people who are doubters, uh, and that uh, in our doubting we are not alone. So uh, I thought it was a little bit specious, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this is how it begins. Uh, we see uh, uh, some of the students uh, at the very outset uh, in their domestic milieu uh, going um, out uh, to uh, uh, eventually get to the um, uh, church school area. Uh, one of the lads we follow uh, is going to be an altar boy. Uh, and one of the primary figures in this story, um, the uh, Donald Miller boy, uh, happens to also be there to be an altar boy. Uh, we see that he's a little bit uh, self-conscious uh, and asks uh, the uh, boy that we have followed uh, here to this position, uh, to this point, uh, does he think that um, maybe he's too fat? And he says, no, you're, you look okay. So uh, there it is. Um, uh, we get uh, uh, looks at the school. Uh, uh, and those who have gone to parochial schools uh, will uh, maybe be familiar with uh, a lot of that, especially they went uh, uh, in that time period. Um, and uh, I, I suppose everybody has run in, in that milieu has run into a nun, or something akin to uh, Sister Bovier. But at any rate, uh, uh, you get to see the students and so forth. They're a little bit... Um, rowdy as you expect, but uh, perhaps compared to today's students, uh, rather tame. Um, we do uh, get amusing uh, looks at the Meryl Street uh, nun, uh, Bovier, um, sliding about, overseeing, straightening out errant uh, deeds by uh, uh, lads mostly, but sometimes by the uh, lasses too. Uh, and uh, she's rather sharp tongue and uh, can be uh, pointed um, uh, with words, uh, she need not pull out a ruler, ruler to swat uh, a, a lad or lass on the, um, uh, on the hand, um, but uh, she can uh, put forth words that uh, have similar thumping effect. At any rate, um, uh, kind of contrasting with the Streep character is uh, Amy uh, Adams' uh, sister James, who is a uh, unusually pretty and you know, uh, she uh, is very nice uh, it seems um, but um, perhaps uh, she uh, is the the one who gets the whole thing going it is uh, she is the one who brings her suspicions to sister Aloysius uh, and sister Aloysius apparently unmentioned I had some private views that were negative toward uh, Father Flynn. But once uh, she has heard some suspicions, 
uh, in regard to uh, the behavior of Father uh, Flynn toward Donald Middle Miller. He sets the ball rolling, and Sister Aloysius Bouvier does not need to be nudged twice. Um, and so she becomes a sort of um, Sherlock Holmes uh, and prosecutor at the same time. Uh, and uh, she does have a, an overt um, uh, confrontation with uh, the Hoffman character. Uh, it had been uh, disguised, of course, initially uh, to get him into a private uh, colloquy. Um, Sister James is also present uh, on the subject of an upcoming dance. Uh, but uh, she then turns the matter onto Donald Miller. So what is, Don what is this all about, anyhow? Well, uh, it appears that um, uh, Father Flynn had kept Donald Miller uh, in his room uh, an unusual amount of time. And when Donald came back, he seemed sick. He wasn't himself. Something was wrong. Um, and later, Sister James saw Father Flynn uh, take a uh, shirt, perhaps a t-shirt, belonging to um, uh, Donald Miller and put it in his locker. And um, uh, there uh, seemed to be something out of the order here. Well, it, it seems like a, um, a rather thin uh, group of circumstances upon which to make allegations. But um, uh, within the context, particularly uh, of 1964, but uh, nevertheless, since this film is actually about a present time, I would guess, uh, this is um, all that's needed by uh, Sister uh, Bouvier to, to get going. And she confronts him. Uh, he tells her that Donald Miller uh, had drunk some of the altar wine and had gotten sick. Uh, and that, uh, you know, he had uh, simply uh, tried to um, uh, take care of the lad in the, in the sense of, um, uh, of uh, talking him or uh, getting him out of, of uh, serious trouble because uh, doing that is enough to bar uh, a lad from being an altar boy. So uh, essentially we see a, a kind of a cover up uh, and um, this is done uh, for the best intentions, presumably. But uh, does it wash with Sister Bouvier? Uh, she is still suspicious. Uh, Sister James immediately bites on uh, this uh, piece of evidence from um, Father Flynn uh, uh, about um, uh, why it happened and, um, and accepts it uh, and wants to forget about it, but not uh, Sister Bouvier. Uh, Sister Bouvier uh, also uh, uh, wants to um, talk to Donald, wants to talk to the parents, uh, wants to um, also check on the background of Father Flynn. Uh, she finds out that he's moved a few times from church to church. Uh, and um, uh, there are uh, some indications uh, at one point um, uh, some of the other boys knock the books out of his hands, uh, for, that is, um, of um, the lad Miller. Uh, and he's a little upset, and it just happens that Father Flynn comes in at that time and kind of helps him and gives him a hug and encouragement and so forth, which is witnessed, I think, by Sister James or something like this. And um, again, uh, it's a matter that could be misconstrued if one is in a misconstruing sort of frame of mind. Uh, and that's exactly what we have here in this particular movie. There's also, also scenes that would seem to suggest uh, maybe um, uh, something uh, to it uh, in the sense that we see uh, Flynn with a couple of the priests uh, at a meal uh, in which um, uh, we see Flynn uh, cutting some very rare uh, beef uh, and uh, they're laughing and joking, and he's making some sort of commentary about a fat woman that has the other priest rolling in the house, as it were. Um, 
So uh, this uh, little vivid scene um, uh, may be construed uh, in a negative way toward him uh, by the viewer, although, of course, Sister Aloysius Bouvier would have no knowledge about uh, that or anything else. But um, all she needs to have is her own um, uh, piercing uh, 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 analysis of him um, from the outside, uh, reinforced by information about his moving and about these other events and so forth. She meets with um, the lad Miller's uh, mother, Viola, uh, and to her amazement, uh, Viola Davis's character, uh, Mrs. Miller, uh, is not in the mind to um, make trouble for Donald and this father, Flynn. She brings forth the information that Donald is a little different, uh, that his father beats him up all the time, uh, that he can't help being what he is. There is a suggestion uh, that he is, um, according to nature, uh, a little on the soft side, shall we say. Um, not the kind of image that um, a, a, a father who thinks of himself as macho and a uh, man's man or that kind of deal, I would want to be showcasing uh, to his pals. So uh, we get all these kinds of interesting little tidbits thrown in um, and eventually, um, Father Flynn uh, uh, kind of seems to capitulate to the relentless pressure from Sister Bovier. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, he is given a new position at a bigger church, uh, and we see him uh, telling his um, uh, par parishioners um, at a um, sermon uh, uh, situation that he would be leaving them and uh, he wanted to go forth and meet them all and say goodbye and so forth. Um, you never know when you're going to, how long you'll be someplace or when you're going to have to go and so forth. Well, at any rate, when this is discovered by um, uh, Sister Bovier, she, um, she said, well, he, he's got a promotion. And so she's very disturbed about this. Uh, toward the end of the movie, there's a moment for a colloquy between uh, Sister James and uh, Father Brendan um, uh, Flynn, and uh, she seems to have been kind of won, won over to him. Uh, he goes on off, um, uh, and uh, Sister James and Sister Bovier at the end have a little colloquy. And it is at this point in time that uh, the moviegoer uh, suddenly realizes uh, that uh, Sister Bovier herself uh, was a person who had um, closeted uh, doubts. So uh, you leave the movie uh, with a nice period film with some uh, aspects that um, uh, might be kind of congenial in a memory lane sort of way but with a thematic um, uh, Mexican standoff, as it were. <laughs> who, who knows, you know, uh, again, I get back to Elvis' uh, suspicion driving us apart and so forth. So um, uh, this is the way it is. <laughs> This lady in a black robe came forward with this little baby. And at first I didn't realize it was a, a, a real baby. And she just laid it on the altar. It was breathing, but it wasn't crying. And then the high priest just took the athami, or the ceremonial dagger, and just cut the baby's throat and caught the blood in a chalice. 
at that point, I, I was staggering, reeling. I thought I was just going to, to throw up. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. But by then, I was so scared that I just stood there. And then when I was led forward, I thought, this is it, it's your turn, they're going to kill you. Um, and I was lifted up onto the altar. Now, I, I at that time was still in white. It was part of a, um, a sacrifice known as the Sacrifice of the White Virgin. Um, and the same blood that had come from the baby was daubed all over my body. Then the high priest raped me. And I think at that moment, I, I was just, the fact I was still alive went through my mind. I then had to sign in blood a parchment stating that I would never ever reveal what had happened in a coffin. If I did, I would die. If we look at the number of, of children that are missing, uh, the number of teenagers that are missing, I think we can probably, with some degree of safety, assume that uh, a significant percentage of them are ending up dead because of ritual satanic murder. And this is because there are more and more Satanists. Are human beings being sacrificed? Yes, they are. It's, just, it's not all the time what you think, whether they're dragged and carted away and laid on some altar somewhere and cut open and have body parts removed. That's not always what happens. It may be just as simple as someone um, being mad at someone and going up and blowing their head off with a gun or stabbing them with a knife, or even poison them. There's a lot of things that I would look for to uh, make a determination on a ritualistic crime. It could be marks that are found at the scene. It may be things like a pentagram. It may be an upside down cross. It could be, again, the number 666. It could be a loss of blood in the body, uh, certain parts removed in a certain manner. They're victims. Some are targeted for specific reasons. One, because they wouldn't join too because uh, they did join and they want to drop out. Some of their victims are themselves. They voluntarily do it. When you join Satanism, you take an oath that will state that you're there till you die. And the biggest gift that you can give Satan is to die uh, voluntarily as a sacrifice. Uh, the human being is a precious instrument in the eyes of the Lord. If somebody can come along, a Satanist, come along and destroy murder something that God loves, that's just what the devil wants. These various satanic covens that meet need to have this kind of sacrifice for their high festival days. And it's sort of, a, I hate to say it like this, but it's like supply and demand. The more satanic covens there are, the more children and babies and teenagers are going to be brought out and sacrificed. And again, it is the destruction of innocence that they seek. That's why children are sought. That's why uh, teenagers are sought. That's why, uh, oddly enough, Christians are sought. In my interviews with uh, former Satanists and their victims, it's really uh, a common thing to uh, perform sacrifices and rituals on religious holidays, specifically Christmas uh, and Easter. And when they do it on those days, simply to, to blaspheme the Christian faith. In many satanic groups, a mother will be asked to sacrifice her own child to Satan, and she may even, in fact, be ritually impregnated to do that. She may even specifically have, have been impregnated, and then when the child is born, they never register the child as being born, and they kill it in a very horrible way, and sometimes the mother herself is actually asked to do it. From one of the nicer, quieter, more beautiful parts of England, namely the county of Surrey, where people would find it hard to believe that these things go on, there is a confession from a, a woman who said that her baby, uh, when born, was used as a human sacrifice in satanic rituals. She said it herself. She has said it in public. Uh, what, do you, what does one make of that other than a, a heartbreaking confession to something that's been a guilty secret for a long time? Because this high priest could have his pick of any woman in the coven, and I was the youngest one there, it was usually me that was chosen. Uh, and then I got pregnant. And I was terrified. I didn't want the baby, but I didn't want it to end up on an altar. The law was that it was the master's baby, and therefore he could do as he wished with it. So at that point I ran away. Audrey escaped, and unlike many others, her baby's life was not sacrificed to Satan. 
Christians are the Satanist worst enemy. They are out to torment you. They are out to blackmail you. They, they will even kill you. They even tried to kill me um, when I came out of um, black witchcraft. If you're in a church where the Spirit of God is really moving and where the Word of God is really being preached and where prayer is really going up to heaven for the salvation of souls, then they're going to regard you as their mortal enemies and they're going to be out there trying everything they can to, to destroy, to kill, and to maim because that is, of course, the nature of Satan and that is also the nature of his followers. They will try and infiltrate your church they will try and set up whispering campaigns against the pastor and the elders. They may even try to seduce the pastor. For two years I was involved in the Baptist church. I was constantly complaining about... Whoa, that's it folks. We're wrap. We're out of time again. This is Top Hat and Buttered Popcorn. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. I do appreciate your uh, stopping by. Hope to see you again at our next Top Hat and buttered popcorn.